Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the March 28th, 2023 council meeting. The voting members of this committee are myself, Councillor Berg, Councillor O'Connor, and Mayor Jackie Clayton. Mayor Clayton did have another quick meeting that she has to attend to, but she'll be joining us virtually in about half an hour. Uh, look at our agenda. I don't see Rotary Club was supposed to be our first delegation. I don't see them online or here, so we'll see if they come, but I'll take us straight to STARS if that's okay. And just as you're coming up, usually we only give our delegations five minutes, but you did ask for more time today, so we'll give you a bit more time today, but we still do have a lot of business, and more importantly, I know my colleagues usually have lots of questions that I want to give them time for, so I'd just ask you to be as brief as you can with your presentation, and then Council will ask questions, and we're going to do a picture with a plaque presentation at the end of this, just so you folks know. Anyways, come on up, please introduce yourselves, and get into it. Thanks for being here. very pleased to bring you your annual update as well. So I'm Glenda Farndon. I'm the Senior Municipal Relations Liaison for STARS. As well, I'm very pleased to have John Gauguin with us today. Morning, everybody. I'm John Gauguin, Provincial Operations Director, and I've been serving as an aircraft captain with STARS for 22 years as well. Oh. He's the real deal. <laughs> Anyway, we will be... Um, Sorry, just so you're getting it, if you get, those mics don't have to be super close to you, but they have to be pointed right at your mouth. Okay. So that we can all hear you and they can hear you online. Thank you. Is that going to work? Yeah, we can hear you great now. Okay. So we'll be as timely as we possibly can. So first and foremost, I just want to draw your attention to, uh, you know, STARS has always been about critical care and about saving lives. And as you can see, we have a little bit, uh, we're going through some rebranding now after 38 years, so a little bit different logo that you see there. And w as we want to um, progress on critical care, now our new vision is critical care anywhere. Next slide, please. So cur currently, you know, uh, last year, um, We've always had a 10-year affiliation agreement with Alberta Health Services from 20, starting at 2010. During the COVID years then, it's been year to year ever since for 20% block funding from Alberta government. So last year, uh, early in the spring, they did um, announce that they would be looking to move to 50% government funding, which would align them with what we're currently already receiving from Sask Saskatchewan government, as well as even higher amount from Manitoba. So at the end of the year, I'm very pleased to say that Alberta Health Services did come through and top up and give us up to the 50% operational funding. But we are currently in high level discussions right now, whether or not we can seal a deal with them again for a long-term affiliation agreement. So that's yet hopefully to come. On the expenditure side, you can see that more than three quarters of all expenditures are aviation and medically related. Smaller pieces continue to be the emergency link center, as well as this is our fourth year in a row that our base operations and administration costs remain at 12%. CRA allows up to 35% for charitable entities for administration costs. We very much feel we're doing our due diligence. Next slide, please. This is where we're at now. We want to celebrate the fact that City of Grand Prairie is one of our municipal leaders. Everything you see on the map in, across Alberta and into northeastern BC, if it's green, that in means that that is a star supporter annually, just like yourselves, to help us to continue to build a united effort that ensures health and safety network. We've just now welcomed five more rural municipalities as well as five more urban. So either on a fixed rate or per capita rate, we are starting to build municipal regional partnerships now. This means where cities and towns that lie within the boundaries of the county are also on board with the county. So regional partnerships are very, very important and we have significant amount of regional partnerships in the north. So the north is the leader for the entire province. We will be looking forward to a, another logo unveiling for the city of Grand Prairie because you have surpassed over $1 million in collective cumulative support. 
And so we will be wanting to have another meeting with you later to discuss what you'd like to see for a logo unveiling event this spring or summer when your uh, logo will move to the upper cowling, recognizing over $1 million in support. We also are going to be welcoming um, Birch Hills County which will be having their very first logo unveiling. And John and I had the pleasure of being in Edmonton last week to have host uh, Sturgeon County as the very first uh, municipality in central Alberta to have a logo unveiling. Next slide, please. I will look forward to uh, seeing you at the base here in the months to come. So what you see here is just a bit of a data poll that Glenda and I have collected for you. Um, we've included the city of Grand Prairie and the county of Grand Prairie. We average about 51 to 52 calls annually in the entire region. And since 2018, we tally around 260 calls to support kind of the residents within this area. You'll see in the last few years, starting in 2021, Bit of an uptick to 21 and 22 calls respectively here out of formerly the QE2 and then the Grand Prix Regional Hospital. Part of that had to do with COVID, but a lot of that has to do with the uh, Alberta Health Services and the ministry recognizing STARS as a purveyor of critical care. And when the patients are extraordinarily sick, particularly at the new hospital, they need to be sent to Edmonton and we're the team that they call. Next slide, please. So this is information that's been 10 years in the making and we're super excited to bring this information to you. So this is based on postal code. We could go back as far as 2010. So this means no other patient information, only the postal code of the patient where they lived at the time they were flown by STARS. So in addition, also good to remember is the fact this does not include any patients we may have flown but we didn't have their postal code. So it's not complete accuracy on how many patients have been flown from this area. So anyone that had a Grand Prairie postal code since 2010, 338 residents have been flown by STARS. Next slide, please. But this is the more exciting information. The red dots represent where all of those Grand Prairie residents and area where they traveled and needed STARS. Accidents do not always happen when you're close to home or illness or injury. So now you can see across two provinces, we have some municipalities where there's red dots across all of Western Canada, you know, even into Manitoba and areas. So Grand Prairie residents have been served by all three bases in Alberta, as well as across two provinces in Alberta and BC. But more importantly, our partnership represents the fact that your residents have access to STARS across Western Canada, and more importantly, because of our partnership at no cost to them. Next slide, please. So the STARS Emergency Link Center is located in Calgary. They average about 100 answered calls a day. So every time the hospital here locally calls, we may not necessarily fly the patients of this region, but they are always connected with the STARS emergency transport physician as well as our air medical crew team. If you've seen the new STARS commercial, this is kind of the new branding, in that commercial you'll see a transport physician talking to the television screen and then they transfer onto an iPad. In the last many months, we've transferred into what we call virtual care. So for every call that a hospital calls into the STARS emergency link center and a doctor is looking for support, our transport physician will be virtually online with them. And the future state is both the helicopter and all of the equipment in all hospitals across Alberta, but we already have it in our helicopter, will be able in real time to send information to the iPad so the transport doctors and the doctors themselves and the communities can talk in real time both on patient condition and what's actually going on and come up with a course of action to help those people out. Next slide, please. So our H145, um, fleet campaign is complete. We're really proud to announce that all 10 aircraft are paid off and in, in large part to the donation from this city. Um, under the auspice of time, I just really want to say thank you for stepping up as a leader within your community and being a great representative and a leader for cities right across Western Canada. Thank you. Next slide. So certainly, you know, the helicopter is just absolutely amazing with the latest in technology, but also it's important about what's in the back of the helicopter. This new medical interior is like a, definitely an intensive care unit environment, just like in the hospitals. So I just wanted to bring you just a couple of uh, examples of some of the specialized equipment, starting with the handheld iStat lab that you can see. It's the size of a cell phone. 
but more importantly, it provides vital test results in less than two minutes with only a couple of drops of blood for hemoglobin, blood gases, even electrolytes, all really vital components that are necessary when you're run running multiple pain management drugs for a trauma patient. Next slide, please. Of course, the video laryngoscope. So you can see that it is an advancement in intubation because on the video screen, our crews can actually view the trachea. It's especially important when they're managing difficult airways, such as for a trauma patient, a burn patient, maybe someone that's been crushed on impact. It's vital that we're able to intubate first time effectively immediately, right, for a patient that can no longer breathe for themselves. And it certainly got a good workout during the COVID years as well, because most of those patients had to be intubated. Handheld ultrasound. Now, again, it's the size of a cell phone. The older version was a great big boxy unit that we had to carry around, put between the patient's legs. And this is just unbelievable. So it provides test results and the rapid diagnosis of collapsed lungs, any kind of trauma-related internal bleeding, heart abnormalities, even fetal compromise in ill or injured pregnant mothers. We can now expedite the treatment plans because with the test results, the way the new helicopter is equipped with integrated Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, satellite connectivity. Now we can actually real time transmit the test results while we're en route to the hospital to the receiving doctors so they can expedite the treatment plans and those patients can go directly into neurosurgery, cardiac cath lab, whatever they may be needing as soon as they arrive. We always carry two units of universal blood, blood that can be accepted by any one of us. We were the very first helicopter EMS program in North America to bring this life-saving advancement on board, and we're very proud of that fact. Next slide, please. And of course, you also need to have the highest level of critical care expertise. And so, last year, we're very proud of our crew members, Kevin Easton and Chris Fay. There's a air medical transport conference and simulation competition each year. This is national, in, international. And we have lots of different areas where um, we continue to work together. So we always host our own internal competition amongst all our star spaces to allow only one team of two to represent STARS annually each year at this particular competition. We have participated for 20 years, and STARS has placed internationally all 20 years in the top three. The last, this last year, we were, took first place, and this marks the seventh time that STARS has taken first place internationally. We're extremely proud of our crew members and honored that we are bringing the highest level of critical care to your residents. And in closing, next slide please. I just want to say thank you for 16 years of partnership. Thank you for your leadership, your dedication, and your support of STARS. We continue to um, want to progress. We're very excited to have you um, acknowledged as a municipal leader across Alberta. We can't wait to have another logo unveiling with you. A life is saved every day, literally, every day. And it's partnership that makes it possible. And with that, uh, we would like to make a presentation to you as well and then of course we welcome any questions excellent well thank you sorry with you. maybe I'll do questions first and then I'll do the plaque presentation certainly awesome uh, I see Councillor O'Connor and then Councillor Bosch thank you chair Bressy uh, Glenda uh, always so much passion appreciate it thank you uh, as you know uh, I was one of the uh, 2012, almost died in a motorcycle accident, and stars were there to save my life. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Thank you, Michael. So, I am so impressed to see Star Trek 
technology. All of us grew up on <laughs> Star Trek and the little, I said, why don't we have one of those things and go beep, 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 beep. Anyway, uh, I really appreciate the level of the technology and implementing that. This is state of the art. So congratulations. My heart goes out to you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor O'Connor. Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Chair Bressy. Yeah, thanks for uh, letting us have Mike uh, years later in our, uh, in our surrounding. Yes, really. <laughs> um, Mike, <laughs> thank you for the presentation. My question to you is, now that the 10 helicopters are paid off, what's, what's the plan? What's the upcoming plan? And what do you do with the old choppers? Mm. Great, great question. Um, donor dollars are always paramount in our thought process and business case. So we have sold all but two of our previous helicopters. So BK-117s as well as the AW-139. Uh, this past week we had a pediatric team from Florida come up and look at the third AW-139, which is stationed out of Saskatoon. We are planning a fundraising initiative to have one of the helicopters possibly put in an Alberta Aviation Museum. And then the final helicopter is owned by the province of Manitoba. What is our plan? Again, continued 12% for administrative costs, um, continued expansion of how to offer critical care anywhere and what that may look like, particularly in communities that are now looking at connectivity through satellite and other and bringing virtual care to them, looking at training their nurses and doctors in these remote communities. And remote can be Grand Cache as, as well as far north and far Arctic and making sure that we're speaking the same language and closing the gap on patient care between the time that they first call us and then when we actually can send critical care to that community. That's the plan, is delivering critical care in any fashion, not necessarily by helicopter. And if there's a headline, STARS is more than the helicopter. I think that's probably the headline moving forward. Mm -hmm. second. Um, my second question, thank you for that. Uh, it's good to know that as you have ground ambulance as well. And so I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know? So we're just probably in the next month, we've been asked by Alberta, Alberta Health Services to initiate a ground response. So we partner with Alberta Health Services right now. If the helicopter can't fly, they'll often come and pick up our team and transport us out to a scene or out to a hospital with limited resources. We've also been asked if we can provide our own vehicle. So in the event that AHS does not have an ambulance or it's being used for another important matter, we can bring ourselves to a hospital or to a scene call in our own vehicle and then come back by ground ambulance. That is the plan in the next two months. Awesome. Uh, my other question is, <clears throat> uh, the map where it showed all the green people participating, there's some that aren't. So. What happens if there's a call to service in Lacklebish or um, Yellowhead? Do you still go? And then how does that work? Well, absolutely. Like we, we are a charitable model for 38 years, right? We go to wherever, whoever needs us. And so we're just trying to expand on the fact. But certainly I am still working with all of those municipalities. We were just a few weeks back in Parkland County. Uh, I think that they are um, preparing to see and have asked us to come back in the next budget cycle to see if, if they can come on board as well. Um, Lesser Slave River is uh, pending. I've already asked them and, and they, we, they are we are in their budget deliberations. Lac La Biche, I am just waiting to hear back to go and meet with them. So most of those, like we're really closing the gap now on across the province, you know, we're past the 90% mark with adding the new five rural municipalities. And then also building those regional partnerships within by adding the five new urbans. So this is going to be an ongoing process, but the goal is that we will unite all Albertans across you know, it's not a large amount. The, it stems anywhere from $2 per capita up to $90 per capita and everything in between, depending on what the capacity is, depending on how that particular municipality views STARS. Some of them are paying some very significant dollars because they view us as the lifeline. You know, some of them, it's two to three hours ground ambulance response one way 
It's a 40-minute flight for us, and we are bringing the care, intensive care unit environment with us, as well as that critical care expertise. So it's very much just a united effort. I think that's that's the biggest thing, is that, you know, it, it's a united effort. Currently, we're generating just over $2 million annually. That really does help to upset, offset costs, though. It, yeah, I can't even tell you how how much time and effort uh, it would take and labor intensive to try to host a lot of community events to raise $2 million per year. You know, this small collective effort of all municipalities working together, it's pretty significant. I'm happy to hear that uh, the calls to service are, you know, everywhere um, until, until they get on board. <laughs> Thanks. Councillor Blackmore. I am so delighted to listen to you speak about something that you're so passionate about. And I remember when you first started with STARS and it was a small, really was a small organization just, you know, how long ago is that? Maybe 15 years? This is my 17th year. 17 years. Uh, and uh, I truly believe that this organization has grown because people like you are just so passionate about providing a service that is stellar, is above beyond anything else in the world. Um, when you talk to those communities that haven't yet uh, put their money where their mouth is, is there anything we can do to help you? Um, yes, certainly. Like um, through the Lac La Bichere, that's a zone five. So actually the chair was Beaver County this year and they invited me to the zone meeting. So I was able to meet with everyone, which I think really encouraged a lot of the the partners so those are always great opportunities also um, I'd love to work with you maybe with a AUMA to uh, like in Saskatchewan they had put forward a um, voluntary resolution that anyone that wanted to do their two dollars per capita could and in Saskatchewan they have like 97 percent are, are on board so that's an opportunity to uh, maybe work with AUMA on something similar um, for a voluntary resolution just to get more of these, uh, the towns and the villages on board. You know, we have some villages that I'm just overwhelmed when I go there and ask them for the $2 per capita and they say, that's not enough. We want to give you four. Okay, <laughs> thank you. You know, so it, it's just that building on that united effort that we all feel good, that we're all just doing a little something to secure that we always have access to this. And now across Western Canada, I don't think we can make a bigger impact to our residents to say, you have this if you should find yourself in a position where you're having the worst day in your entire life. I got pointed to because I'm on the board of Alberta municipalities, but I just point out that the board does what the membership tells us to. So if our council wants Alberta municipalities to do that, then we should put forward a resolution to debate at the fall convention. I'd be happy to work with our council to get that resolution to the floor so the board can take uh, direction from membership if this council wants to do that. Thank you. If they're open to a presentation, we're open to being there to bring them key information. And, and definitely happy to talk offline with you folks about about convention and how to get in front of our membership there and all that. I'm definitely happy to talk about that as well. Thank you. Any other questions looking around the table? Excellent. Well, we've got the best part of the day. We've got a plaque presentation to do. So Absolutely. What I'm, what I'm thinking is why don't all of us that are in chambers today get there for the picture? So why don't we just come stand in front of Mayor Clayton's spot?
looking right. Thank you for your time. Well, I'll definitely appreciate the feel-good presentation, and now it's time for our committee to roll up its sleeves and get to work. And first up, I will go to Chief Lemieux with his service area update. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. So I'm going to start with uh, community social development. Uh, I just want to advise that four Youth Advisory Council members participated in the coldest night of the year event in, on February the 25th. They joined a group of city councillors to... Uh, complete a five kilometer walk and it was a fundraiser for the Canadian Mental Health Association. So thank you very much for the, those who participated in that event. And our home support program concluded an annual client survey with 40% uh, of people, or 40% of the surveys returned. And based on the results, 84% of respondents reported that the home support program has contributed to them being able to remain in their own homes and uh, made them aware uh, of better access needed for through community services, so that's a real success story. On a housing and homelessness initiative uh, front, we, we will be publishing our point in time count for homeless uh, in our community. That'll be published later this week. The numbers in 2018 were 238. Uh, there was no survey done in 2020 due to COVID, so it's been four years, but the numbers in 2022 are 328. So we are up, and uh, that information and all the details will be published uh, later this week. On enforcement services side, uh, during the early morning hours of March the 17th, unfortunately, six city vehicles parked at City of 99 were vandalized. Uh, the vehicles had to be towed to the City Service Centre to be evaluated, and uh, ongoing uh, repairs are happening on those vehicles. The matter was turned over to the RCMP right away and a uh, suspect was identified the same evening that suspect was located and taken into custody. Um, I want to mention also on the enforcement services side that the, the government of Alberta is introducing a program called the Advanced Programs Information System, referred to as APIS, and it's an e-ticketing system that will be rolled out in May of 2023. The real benefit for us on that program is that we anticipate major savings in officer and admin uh, time spent manually writing tickets, and also we expect considerable time savings in preparation of uh, court package documents. So that's a real uh, positive change. Uh, the fire department is currently hosting a fire safety officer course and firefighters from several departments in northern Alberta are in attendance. So they've opened that subscription, that uh, opportunity to other fire departments and many others are participating. So that's a good news story. Uh, on the RCMP front, the annual performance planning consultation with the city happened uh, in at the beginning of March. Some of you participated in that uh, planning session. And the priorities have been identified and a final report will be forwarded to Council very shortly. 
uh, from the Community Knowledge Campus. Uh, fitness instructors now offer a unique interactive video-based fitness programming in the Cycle Studio, which allow participants to meet their group targets and achieve their personal best while experiencing scenery from around the world. So I'd highly encourage you to uh, have a look at that. It's a really cool program. On uh, sports development, wellness, and culture, as part of the city's sports tourism initiatives, the city submitted a bid for the to host the Water Polo 2024 uh, National Championship League 17U Western Conference Finals. So that submission has been uh, uh, submitted. And uh, finally, from transit, uh, an accessible transit survey was conducted by our communications department, and surveys were provided to customers online and paper copies on the buses. We received 34 total responses, and 59, 50, sorry, 52% were satisfied or very satisfied with the service. 32% uh, were neutral and 15% were dissatisfied with the service. So what people liked the most was helpfulness of our operators, the personal safety, the cost of the service, the seat availability and the convenience of the service. And the areas that we need to pay attention to were service reliability and hours of service, which we are addressing shortly. So uh, Mr. Chair, that's my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So thank you, Councillor Berg, and then Councillor Bosch. Yeah, thank you, Chair Bressy. So my question with the transit survey, do we have previous similar surveys to measure against to see how we're making progress on? Um, I don't have that information at the tip of my fingers, but I'll certainly, uh, we'll be circulating the results of that uh, accessible transit survey, and I'll make sure to include any information from any previous surveys so you can compare. Great, thank you. Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Chair Bressy. Can you just uh, give us a little more information, or me? Maybe I'm the only one. I don't know. Uh, the e-ticketing system on the process of that and, and how it works and in what, like, is it just parking? Is it all bylaw matters? So the, uh, yeah, I'll provide you as best as I can. I have some, some, uh, some details on it. So the e-ticketing system will be uh, for traffic violations. So uh, uh, I believe the way it will work is that uh, the officer will be able to scan your driver's license, which will generate a ticket. So it will be no longer a hand handwritten ticket. So a lot of it is being um, uh, done in a digital fashion. So we don't have to get back to the office and re-enter the tickets in different systems. It'll all be automated. And I believe that uh, if somebody wants to contest a ticket, a lot of that information can be done online. And a lot of that can be dealt with um, online as opposed to everything have to go to court. Now there's still be an opportunity for people to go to court, but the entire system will be much more uh, streamlined, which will save us a lot of admin time. So in cases like, um dealing with animals and dealing with, you know, unsightly properties, would you use the same type of system? Not at this time, but certainly that's something we may look at into the future. This is a government of Alberta province-wide uh, system that's being introduced. It's, uh, it's separate from our bylaw. Okay, thank you. A question I've got about that system, Chief Lemieux, and I suspect you don't have the answer now, and so just getting it by email is fine if you don't have it, but this was something the province was going to move to a couple years ago. We invested significant money and equipment and training for it, and really glad it's coming back, but I'm wondering if we had to reinvest a lot of money into this program after the government delayed it for two years. So the answer to that is no, we did not have to reinvest, and we are ready to go. And I believe that part of the delay was some members of uh, the communities weren't happy with the fact that there are some processes such as, I think you had to you had to pay a fee if you want to contest your ticket, and people are saying, you're already writing me a ticket, now I have to pay a fee to contest the ticket. And so some, some of those changes have been made, uh, but no, it will, no additional costs and we're ready to go. Excellent, so, yeah, and it's the, the pullback was probably good. There's also a tribunal system without judicial oversight that was concerning, so good news that it's coming. I didn't know it was, Coming back, and that's a good news story. So thanks for the update on that. Uh, Councillor Thiessen. Thanks, uh, Chair Bresti. Uh, sorry, Chief Lemieux. Uh, I just have a question uh, re regarding something that's a bit uncomfortable. But uh, last week at the East Link Center, we had an unfortunate incident with uh, somebody entering into certain change rooms they weren't, I guess, necessarily allowed to. I know that uh, in the media, we've I've, I've read and I've talked about, and I'm trying to talk with the public about this this incident as to what the City of Grand Prairie is doing to mitigate uh, an incident such as what transpired a week ago. 
at the East Link Center. Um, so is there any plans in progress or can you update council on what we might do differently next time? So Mr. Chair, I'll be very brief on this one. And what I will say is that we followed all of our protocols and the uh, matter was very professionally handled by all of our staff. Um, and I just, uh, I'm not gonna say any more because I believe that uh, the police might now be involved in that particular item. So I just, uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Any other questions? Not seen any, so thank you for the service area update. We always appreciate it. And next up, I've got Mr. Harvard for subsidized bus pass report. Thank you and good morning, Chair and committee men members. As committee has had an opportunity to review the report, I'll just give a couple of quick highlights and then, of course, available for all questions. A uh, motion was passed December the 2nd, 2022, at the meeting of the Public and Protective Services Committee directing administration to bring back a report with information regarding subsidized bus passes for dependents of age recipients and children under 16, including budget implications. The report that you have and that you've read um, contains the current subsidy programs that the city does offer uh, currently. Um, and the attachment, number one, contains all the information that we were able to, uh, uh, to gather from uh, comparable uh, municipalities with regards to both their age programs and their, uh, their youth fairs. Um, overall, Grand Prairie, um, our age subsidy compares very favorably with uh, other communities. Our youth fair cutoff age is, is similar to most communities. Some are better and uh, you know, some are, are, are the same. So um, what we are recommending is um, free transit to all youth between the ages of six to 17 and that the fees, rates and charges by law C1395 be amended as follows. Youth ages six to 17 free. Um, Northwest Polytechnic students will remain the same as the current fee structure. Um, I will take any questions at this point. Councillor Thiessen, then Councillor O'Connor. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks, Chair Bressy. Um, uh, no, this is something that I've long advocated for. I think if we're going to increase ridership, uh, we need to start start young, especially on the transit. So you get kids familiar with the systems and the routes and stuff like that. And it doesn't seem as scary. I know for me as a 13 year old in Edmonton, it was really scary to step on my bus for the first time and learn that route to school. Uh, and for $90,000, this seems like a very, very small price to pay to, to I guess, improve our, our carbon footprint uh, and, and to get more active ridership in our transit system. Um, so I guess my question for you is just in regards to the six to 17 year old, uh, would, would students be required to show like a student ID or an ID when they get on the bus and how is a bus driver going to determine whether someone's 17 or 19? Um, through the chair, uh, even currently, if you think about it, it's, it's problematic, um, for, for our drivers to actually, we're not going to be asking for any, uh, uh, any ID or such. Uh, it really is the honor system. For, uh, for the most part, as I said, as it currently is right now. So that won't change. Uh, but what, we'll, what we will do is uh, ensure that every, um, every youth has a bus pass assigned or assigned to them so that we are able to uh, obviously track all that ridership as well. As, as you mentioned at the onset, um, this is an excellent uh, way to uh, you know just to get ridership moving in the right direction, and, and to um, you know introduce transit to a, a group of, of uh, people, well, a group of uh, young adults uh, who wouldn't ordinarily pot potentially take transit, but you know if the price is right, sometimes they do, and if we can influence them at those uh, those critical ages, that 13 to 16 age group, um, we have a really good uh, chance of hanging on to them as they uh, move forward into the. Uh, uh, into the later years. Awesome, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I do have a couple other questions, but I have one supplemental, if I may ask. Sure, just a supplemental, then I'm happy to come back to you for additional questions. For sure, and hopefully my council peers will ask the questions I have in my mind. Um, so in, in regards to uh, distributing the bus passes, uh, would we be working with the school boards, uh, the Catholic and public and Peace Wapiti, in order to disseminate those to students, or would they have to come to City Hall to pick them up? 
Through the chair, um, the specifics we haven't yet worked out. Um, that seems to be the most logical way of doing it. Um, but certainly, that said, um, you know we'll have to set up um, um, areas where, excuse me, um, facilities where people can you know pick them up as well, right? If they're not able to pick them up through the schools, but, through, but currently the schools are the are our best option in terms of that. Yes. Awesome. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Councillor O'Connor, and then Councillor Bosch. Yep. Thank you, Chair Brussy. Uh, thank you very much for your report. Very, very comprehensive, and I like the comparison to other communities. I think this is the right step to go, and uh, I'm just concerned uh, just what the financial impact. So my question would be to uh, Ms. Whiteway as to uh, is this covered and are we okay with our budget and this won't impact us? Uh, thank you, through the Chair. I believe that uh, Mr. Harvard uh, had identified in the report that if required, the financial stabilization reserve could be used. But um, we are always uh, uh, looking to balance the budget uh, by the end of the year. So I'm confident that it will be managed. Yeah. This is a very good step in the right direction to serve the quality of life of our community. So thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank you. I'm just going to hop in because I've got a question about that one, if that's all right with you. Oh, okay. Uh, my question is the 90,000 identified in this report, is that the anticipated impact for the remaining 2023 fiscal year, or is that our anticipated annual impact of this change? I don't know if that's Mr. Harvard or Mr. Whiteway question. Or Ms. Whiteway, sorry. Um, the, uh, yes, Chair, that, that's an annual uh, amount. Excellent. Thank you. Councillor Thiessen? I'm uh, just uh, wondering about the accessibility of on-demand. I know that it was highlighted a little bit in the report, but uh, for youth wanting to travel uh, outside of the transit zone or at hours that are a little later in the evening where the service doesn't exist, I know we have uh, uh, an on-demand system that we work with. Uh, y Drive is in one section, uh, and then our own. Uh, would they be? Would they have the same? Uh, I guess access to on-demand transit uh, with the free bus passes through the chair. Uh, yes, on-demand is just another service delivery model, so it is just, it, it's similar to the big buses, so absolutely they would have access to that. Cool, thank you. Councillor O'Connor. If you're ready for business. Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, my apologies, no, sorry, I'm going to go to Councillor Plot first. Okay, thanks. Councillor Plot. Thanks, Chair Bressy. Um, just, a, 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 I guess, a question for me. On, I'm happy to, I'm, I'm not part of the committee, but I'm happy that this is going to come to council and I will be supportive of it. I'm just wondering if we're going to be tracking or if we have a mechanism of tracking all the current ways that we're using to help age and youth. And I'm just asking that because, I, you know, we constantly hear we need to do more, and I'm not sure how much we already do. And I think it'd be nice to kind of know, uh, to tell the community how much we are helping our youth and our age folks that, you know, we do do a lot of those things, and, and I think we should continue to do them. I just, I'm wondering if we were, if we should be capturing how much we're spending on those areas and how much we're actually allocating to those groups. So, just wonder if administration has uh, a plan with that, or um, if I should look at making a motion out of the committee to stop at a certain point. Maybe that might be a bigger question than just transit. So maybe I'll look at Chief Lemieux to see if he's got a response to that. I'm sorry. Could I just ask for? Clarification on the question, Mr. Plot, please. Yeah, I'm just wondering, and again, I appreciate what we're trying to do here. I'm just wondering, are we are we doing a side tablet tracking of all the ways we support H and youth in our community? Just, I feel like through comms, this is a great opportunity to remind people yet again of all the things we do above and beyond that we don't necessarily have to do, but we're choosing to do. And if we're articulate capturing all the expenses that we're doing to help folks with H and help our youth. Yeah, so... Similar to how we gift in kinds and, I guess, our, our community group funding. Yeah, so thank you for the question. So through the chair, uh, I think we have systems within transit where we could do some monitoring, and, and uh, but uh, in terms of AISH, I don't have the answer, um, but certainly something we'll look at, and then we'll try and get some information back to, uh, to committee on that. Also, look at Chief White, we might have some information to add as well. Yeah, thank you, Chair Brassi. So um, we do have the ability through um, all of our departments that provide um, different services uh, for H or, or other um, 
individuals. So it is something that we can gather and um, publish. So we'll look at uh, giving maybe through Chief Lemieux's uh, update one day at committee, we could uh, give what that number looks like. Thank you. No, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. I've seen another hands up. So, Councillor O'Connor, you were willing to do some business? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Bressy. I'd like to move committee recommend council approve free transit for all youth ages 6 to 17 and that administration amend the fees, rates, and charges by law to reflect this change. Excellent. Thank you. I'm, I'm not seeing hands up, so I'll speak to it first. Uh, definitely support it. I'm excited to get more kids on our bus and make it easier for them to get around the community. I'll also add that this report was discussed at Youth Advisory Council this Sunday, and they were Youth Advisory Council is quite excited to hear about this possibility. Their feedback was it should go up to 24 instead of 17, but other than that, it's great. Uh, the feedback I gave to Youth Advisory Council they seemed to take well was, well, wait to see what council does. If council doesn't do this and you think they should have, or if council does and you think they should go farther, then maybe this is something that we engage with council in October, November during budget engagement as a youth advisory committee. So they think we should go a little bit further, but they were found it really promising that we might go this far. And so I thought I'd share that as well. I think my one concern about it that I wanna keep my eyes on, and it's just based on experience in other communities, is with our on-demand system and school kids, there's been some of the communities are having real issues with their on-demand because school kids are discovering that on-demand is a lot more convenient to get to school than the school buses that are being paid on fixed routes to take them to take them to school. And I don't think we've seen that problem in our community yet. And since our on-demand is limited geographically, maybe we won't. But that's the one thing, the one concern I have that I'll be keeping my eyes on to make sure that we don't have that issue cropping up. But overall, I'm very excited about this possibility. Anybody else want to get in? All right, I'm not seeing anyone, so I will call this to question. And that motion carries, so thank you, Mr. Harvard, for the report. We appreciate it. And next up, we get to talk about proposed recreation facilities, and I believe that's Ms. Cajole presenting. Thank you, Chair Pressy. Following this one city football club presentation to council earlier this year, administration presented committee with land options for a proposed recreation facility that could be used for a variety of sports and activities, including soccer. Council then referred this item back to the appropriate standing committee for further information. The initial proposal put forward by the delegation outlined a 135,000 square foot air structure or dome. This concept was used to gather information and costs from vendors regarding the structure and installation, and internal stakeholders were consulted to provide a potential budget for the peripheral projects such as foundation, locker rooms, washrooms, and utilities. The information provided by the vendors and internal stakeholders helped to estimate the overall project costs associated with construction of a new recreation facility. These estimates are based on, high, uh, are based on costs reflected in recent projects and current market pricing, and at a high level, this includes vendor costs, direct development costs, and costs arising from detailed design and budgeting for a total project estimate of approximately $10 million. Three potential sites were compared for this project that assess the relevant statutory plans, zoning, and site plans. Additionally, the site selection framework from the Recreation and Culture Strategy was utilized to assess potential sites using criteria that included, but was not limited to, proximity to transportation opportunities, expansion capabilities, and servicing conditions. Administration recommends that committee recommend council approve in principle funding of up to $10 million for an indoor recreation facility and select a preferred site for the facility to enable preparation of detailed budgeting, design, and project planning commencement. Excellent, thank you. Um, I, I will just, just because it just came in last night, so it didn't hit the staff report, but I will hit, I will note that committee received a letter from the Swan City Football Club today um, saying that they'd love to see a 135 square foot dome, but they also feel that 115,000 square feet would be sufficient for their needs. Uh, but they really emphasize that that's for their needs. Uh, they're not speaking for other groups, just for themselves. And they also just encourage us to continue talking with them throughout this process as we move forward because there might be some things 
that we're considering add, adding in that they don't consider uh, needed for needed for their uses. So I don't know if everybody's had a chance to see that letter yet, but thought it was worth sharing. Uh, uh, Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Chair Bressy. Uh, well, in, in regards to that letter, I can appreciate what their needs are, but if we can get in needs for several different types of sport, um, I would prefer that instead of just one. My question is in these budget items, I don't see anything for a concession. Is there like any thought process to that? Because that's not cheap. Thank you, through the chair. Um, no specific um, attention was given to the idea of a concession, but anything that would be considered a periphery um, project would be additional costs to the um, proposed vendor costs. Right. Um, I guess I, I bring that up because if if we move ahead with this at some point, that you know um, there's planning, you know, for for an additional space, for something like that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Plot. Uh, thanks, Chair Bressy. Um, I guess my my question is for administration on the report from from Swan City FC of. If we had looked at 115,000 square foot dome instead of 135, do we do we kind of have a scale of what the cost difference on that might be? Oh, yeah, we heard you, Councillor Platt. We're just looking for the information. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Maybe I was wrong. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and, and I guess while we're on that, um, while admin's looking that up, I just also want to make. Um, I guess some comments for me. The reason I think it's smarter to go with a smaller footprint if soccer thinks they can make that is, again, somebody that's lived in these facilities a lot with my kids over the last few years. I don't see that other 20,000 square feet hurting us in any way to attract any sports and use for our user groups. What I do see, though, is an ability to have 20,000 square feet less that we're heating, building, and occupying. And also, I don't see us having, if this gets split into the traditional four courts that I've seen in most of these dome facilities, I don't think it lowers our rental income moving forward. So I guess for me, I need to understand why the 20,000 square feet feeds the need, because it's going to come with a higher cost. And it also takes 20,000 square feet out of the parking lot where we may be able to, to change that capital instead of building a dome into ongoing parking spots for that area, because I do think that's going to be a concern moving forward. So I, again, I just, I, I'm a, a fan of that we're doing this. I think the smaller is would still meet all the needs in the community and, and go and beyond. So I'm just wondering if we do have any numbers to see the differences on that. Ms. Casually. Thank you, through the chair. Um, administration does not have those numbers available like at my fingertips. Um, I do know that the cost per square footage would potentially be a little bit lower because the size um, would be uh, smaller. Uh, certainly the proposal for the project was brought forward or the Costs that were identified in the report were brought forward as a result of the proposal that was prepared by the delegation at the 135,000 square feet. So we could certainly explore options as part of the uh, competitive bid process uh, for something in a smaller size. Okay, just if I can, Councilor Bressy, just one other one. Um, on the bleachers, I'm noticing there's seating for 3,000, which I think is really exciting, but I don't know if I've ever seen a and a soccer and at the times I've ever been in those buildings, 3,000 people spectating. And I'm just, I'm wondering if that's really a need at this point. I mean, I think it's great to build into having that much seating. Um, the sidelines are long. There's a lot of parents that do want to stand. There's a lot of people that will stand. So I appreciate that the facilities I've been have had their little rollout metal. They probably sit about 150 or 200 people. I could see us getting some of those for the facility, maybe one or two per four, for, per four courts. I just feel that that's a lot of, of extra storage, extra space that's actually being used by bleachers that I don't know if we'll utilize. So I guess for me, I'm a little bit in the weeds on this one, but I think that seems like an awful lot of seating to me to start off with and something I think we could grow into. I think that's some capital money that we could, there's a, probably a couple hundred thousand dollars there in my opinion that doesn't need to be spent. So um, just some other food for thought just from analytics of, of me being in these facilities a lot of, I think it's nice to think of 3,000 seats. I just... I don't know if I've ever seen that in any building where there's been 3,000 people sitting in those bleachers uh, when I've been at provincials. So just another, another comment. Thanks, Councillor Bressy. I see Mayor Clayton, and I know the, most of the rest of you want to get in, but I'll let Mayor Clayton go next. 
Thanks, Chair Bressy. Um, some of the questions were addressed from Councilor Plot, but um, seeing the letter identifying that a smaller facility um, will work for the organization and for multi-sport, I think is is interesting. Um, and and then end of the day, if we don't need to spend more money, why would we? I guess my question would be um, twofold. Ms. Casually, at a smaller facility, are we still uh, comfortable that we'd be able to host? provincial level um, events and, and, and competition. Uh, thank you through the chair. Uh, yes, that is my understanding. Okay, perfect. And just um, thank you for that information. And just a comment to Councillor Quad. I think today, you know, the intent is for committee to get this to council, and and then in turn uh, would come back a, a detailed budgeting, design, and project planning com um, commencement timelines, etc. So nagging over a couple hundred thousand dollars on ten million dollars, we'll still have a chance to do that um, when the report comes back. So I think it's great to have those considerations in mind. Um, but uh, today, really, committee, let's. In my opinion, let's get this to council for a further discussion. And in the meantime, <clears throat> I would like to uh, hear more from Swan City Football um, because there's nothing worse than building something at a certain size and then three years later somebody goes, well, soccer blew our mind. It's three times the size that we thought and now we need more space and it's a missed opportunity. So if we're going to invest such a significant amount of money, we need to be sure that this is the right size. So I look forward to future discussions. When the business arises, I'm happy to support to send, the, to send this to council. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Berg, then O'Connor, the Blackmore. Yeah, I thank you, Chair Bressy. <clears throat> so my comments are very similar to what the mayor just had mentioned. Um, uh, there's a lot of dynamics at play here. There's three different locations, land owned by a variety of different people, including the city. Um, so I know that there has to be a lot of discussions going forward. So again, when the time comes, I'll, I'll, I'll tend to the business. But um, I just wanted to say that there is a lot of dynamics at play. And uh, I, I'd love to see this go forward. Uh, when we were touring the, the soccer facility in Edmonton, uh, the conversation often was is um, why would we even have the conversation until we know the money's there? So uh, this is that step where we're starting to allocate the funds. And once we know that the money exists and is there, then we can start moving forward with locations and facilities. Councillor O'Connor. Uh, thank you, Chair Brassie. I concur with the mayor and what uh, uh, Grant Berg has said. And my concern is if you build a smaller facility and you don't allow for multi-sport, I think you're doing this, the community a disservice. And I think we should be looking at, uh, uh, at going with the larger size. And if you're gonna put bleachers in there at 3,000, which I agree with uh, uh, Councillor Pilat that maybe that's a little, uh, how would you say, ambitious. However, if we have tournaments and there are multiple spots in there, we don't know what the uh, crowds will be. And I also, having visited the one in Edmonton, the uh, lack of good facilities for washrooms and a concession need to be considered in the design. So I look forward to having this come forward that I think we, at council we should be delivering that. The location and everything else, I, I think that's for a later conversation, but I think we should uh, support moving forward at the 135 uh, size. Councillor Blackmore. Uh, if it's if it's helpful for administration, what uh, what what I would need to see uh, to determine whether we want the larger or smaller one is what the restrictions would be with a smaller one. Is it a, a full size FIFA turf? Is it uh, does it limit the use of other organizations such as Ultimate Frisbee um, if we use a smaller size? Um, what does that mean for lacrosse? Um, there there's a lot of uh, uses for such a dome that I think we need to take into consideration when we look at size. Um, it, in my experience, I don't believe we've ever built a building and people have said, wow, that's way too big 10 years later. So um, generally speaking, you know that if you, if you pay the money up front, you're paying less than you would if you had to build a second structure later on. So um, while I'm not encouraging council to go in that direction at this point, I do need to see 
what the um, what the changes in use would be from one size to the next. That would, to me, would be more important than uh, the square footage cost. Thanks. Councillor Bosch, then back to Mayor Clayton. Thank you, Chair Bressy. I guess that was my uh, comment as well, uh, a heads up for administration for when this comes back to us, is that, for instance, Sport Connection was acknowledged in some of this information gathering as well as you know, fastball, football, and such. And maybe you've done that some of that already. I don't know. But um, I think this venue could be used for far more than soccer. And uh, if if we go 135,000 versus 110, uh, having more than one sport at one time and more people, uh, all the better, in my opinion. But uh, just a heads up. Mayor Clayton. Thanks, Chair Bressy. Question for administration. The In the business arising, the motion that's suggested in the package, I wanted to be clear, <laughs> committees to send this to council for in principle funding of up to $10 million, but it also mentions and select a preferred site. So are you hoping that we are selecting a preferred site and sending that to council for discussion today as well? Ms. Kedgley. <clears throat> Through the chair, uh, thank you. Yes, Mayor Clayton, that would uh, be an ideal situation for administration. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to address that because one of my colleagues had mentioned we can debate over the location later. Um, uh, speaking to that, in my opinion, um, the Smith lands adjacent to um, outdoor soccer as well as the activity reception center has, has always been my personal first choice. It makes an exceptional location for recreation. It makes a hub in our city that becomes multi-sport, multi-facet and actually four season sport reception activity center area of our community. So I'm happy to separate this, uh, Mr. Chairman, into two discussions if you'd like, uh, but my, my intent when appropriate would be to, to uh, make a motion that the, it be located in the Smith subdivision. Thank you. Great, yeah, and I think when it comes to business, it'd be very appropriate to get a motion on the floor about location, but also very appropriate to split that from funding. So I'll make sure I come back to you when that business is arising, Mayor Clayton. Uh, Councillor Plot. Uh, thanks, Chair Bressy. Um, I'm same as Mayor Clayton. I think the Smith location is the highest and best use of that land, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. The Riverstone site is a dual school site, and so potentially a school could still go there if we put this there. We don't have another school site that I'm aware of on the east side of the tracks anywhere in Grand Prairie, so maybe the community will grow and there'll be another site added, but that is something I think we should be careful about not putting that there. I'm also very concerned about putting this in a residential area. Again, from, from being in a lot of tournaments and activities, it, it causes an awful lot of traffic to an area. And so we've already got a school there. If we, we put another facility in that in Riverstone area, I just think we're going to be looking at a lot of very upset people in that area as much as they'd like to have the future. I'm also not sure if a bunch of people want to have their son taken away from a dome. And there will be people that will lose their son uh, from a dome if we put it in that area quite potentially. So. Uh, to me, I think the comm site's got a lot of potential for another multi-purpose facility. Um, so I really like this this Smith subdivision. And it also aligns with the user group that potentially be managing this facility. Down the road, that's probably another conversation, but that's where they want to be. So I just see this as the best use of the land. Um, also would, would look to administration that if this does go forward, of maybe looking at a motion of let's look at pro procuring more land for, for Grand Spirit as we've had conversation with them for what's maybe better use of land for future home or multifamily sites as well, um, as that was one of the triggers on this piece of land. So uh, definitely in support of this best subdivision. Thank you. A couple questions I've got is, speaking about this Smithland, have we engaged engineering at all to look at traffic impacts and if the intersections as currently built in and out of Smith could accommodate traffic that this dome may have? Thank you, through the chair. Um, engineering was involved in as an internal stakeholder in the preparation of the report. Um, so it's definitely some further work could be done in that regard. Okay. Are we anticipating, <laughs> how, well, I guess we're making a transportation offsite levy contribution. So I guess that would take care of some of those issues if we needed to do them. Um, my next my next question is, uh, I haven't seen a footprint for this. So if this was on the Sw Smith land, is this using the entire the entirety of Smith, of the Smith land, or would there still be some land available for some sort of residential development or other development? 
Uh, th thank you through the chair. <clears throat> um, this would utilize the majority, this would utilize the land that is currently owned by the city. Um, and uh, there is a little bit of space still available on the current parcel that sits the activity and reception center that was always intended for future development of potential recreation um, amenities such as an outdoor skating rink or something like that. And then my last question is, if we go forward with this, what happens with the conversations we're having about with the county about the Crosslink, Crosslink Centre? Is this, are we considering this as a replacement of those conversations or we'd continue those conversations as well? Uh, thank you through the chair. I think that would be up to um, council to direct administration. Certainly um, we would work with through the Grand Prairie Regional Recreation um, Committee uh, on this project, similar to the current project. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Councillor O'Connor. Yes, I would like to move to separate uh, the, have, has the... You don't have to move to do it, but if you'd like to make a money motion, you're welcome to make a motion <laughs> about just the money. Okay, I'd like to move that we accept the uh, current proposal for... Thank you. <laughs> it's kind of hard to be in the document and be on this. Um, I'd like to move that council recommend Council in in approve in principle funding of up to ten million for an indoor recreation facility. Excellent, certainly in order, and uh, happy to debate this. And again, we'll just debate. Do in principle, are we okay spending up to ten million dollars on this? And then, if this motion passes, then we'll have another motion to talk about potential locations. So, any discussion on this motion? Um, I guess my last question for administration is, actually, no, I think that'll be for council to decide later, so never mind. I don't have a question for administration. Uh, Councillor Berg? Yeah, I'd just like to speak to this. I do think that the city does need some more recreational facilities, and we've been bantering around that uh, $10 million mark uh, for quite some time, and it's interesting to see that the numbers actually land right around that, so, so this isn't a surprise. Um, so I'd love to see this uh, move forward to council so that we can start uh, looking forward to some more recreation facilities. As we continually hear, there is a high demand for more facilities within the city. Thank you. Mayor Clayton. Thanks, Chair Bressie. Um, I'm just scrolling through the report and maybe Chair Bressie, you can identify for me. Uh, the $10 million is being funded through what stream and if, if it's not identified, my question would be for Ms. Whiteway. I'd like this motion to, um, and maybe the discussion can happen at council, but I'd like to talk about the funding source at some point before the final decision is made. So I'll go to, I see Ms. Whiteway moving her microphone, so I'll go to Chief Whiteway. Uh, thank you, Chair Bressy. So my recommendation, uh, if we were to identify a funding source today, would be debt. Uh, funding and then we can proceed with the uh, appropriate bylaw and next steps. Um, that would be my recommendation. Um, so Mr. Chairman, are you comfortable? Um, I would like that identified today so that council um, does have an opportunity to think about that prior to getting to all of council discussion and debate. Um, so I'm happy to make a subsequent motion. Maybe the mover can add that into the wording, uh, but to your meeting, Mr. Chair, whatever you prefer. You, uh, Councillor Connor, you open to a friendly amendment of $10 million in um, debenture for an indoor recreation facility? Yes, I'd uh, like to add that. Thank you. I'll take that as a friendly amendment. Um, I guess a Question for administration that if you as don't friendly have... as friendly as spending ten million dollars can be. A <laughs> <laughs> I, I question. A question for administration. I can wait till this gets to council if you don't have it today. But do we know what um, annual servicing on a debenture like that might be? Scheduling. Thank you, through the chair. <clears throat> Based on um, eight point uh, six million, was which was uh, not including any of the. Uh, rising costs related to detailed design or budgeting. Um, the annual payments on um, that principle were six hundred, approximately 601000 And over how many years was that? Over 15 years. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Chair Bressy. Now, maybe this isn't the right time, but just um, some more conversation with the soccer clubs and uh, perhaps other clubs. 
the soccer club wanted to put money into this as well and potentially run run this site. So we're, what are we looking at in in that aspect right now? Have we had con conversations of what that looks like out of this 10 million? Angela. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Uh, no, the, there is a motion um, from a previous uh, committee meeting um, that allocated $100,000 in uh, funding to be matched by the soccer club that could potentially be used uh, for this project. Um, in terms of uh, operational costs, the Swan City Football Club certainly did submit as part of their original proposal um, some considerations to operate the facility, um, but those discussions have not occurred to date. Right. Um, I know in speaking to one of the members of that club who was here um, as a delegate, uh, we're, we're looking for significant sponsorship and potentially in, in much higher dollars than 100000 So I'd like to see those conversations continued so that if that is a possibility um, and it reduces our $10 million cost, that'd be fabulous. Mayor Clayton? My apologies, I forgot to lower my hand. Do you have a motion on the floor? I'm not seeing any other hands for this motion, so I will call it to question. And that motion carries, and then, Mayor Clayton, we still have some land issues, and I said that I'd come back to you for that business. Would you still like to make the next motion? Sure, perfect. Yeah, um, I would move the committee recommend council approve the Smith lands for the indoor recreation facility to enable preparation of a more detailed budgeting, design, and project planning commencement. Speaking to this motion, as I earlier indicated, um, I think that adding this amenity to the uh, adjacent outdoor soccer field as well as the activity reception center creates an excellent hub in our community. Uh, access to this facility is through multiple different roadways. It uh, is not in the middle of a residential, although there is some residential adjacent to it. There's also a commercial and industrial through the rail network. And I think that this is a perfect location and it really finishes off that area. And that concept that we had of bringing different amenities to different areas of our community. So I encourage community to support this so council debate and discuss this in full. Thank you. Thank you. Council Blackmore. Um, I have a question for, I think, uh, probably Chief Glavin. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I concur with the mayor that there is uh, ample roadways into the Smith lands and um, there is already uh, issues with traffic coming out of Smith during certain times of the day. And so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Mr. Glavin, um, what types of changes engineering would be making to look at that, um, what we can do to facilitate that more. And finally, my last question is, um, is this area designated as residential or has that, uh, has that changed um, since... I was last familiar with Smith. Director Glavin. Thank you, Chair Bressy. So the, the area is currently designated high density residential uh, where the site is uh, being contemplated. So that would need to be rezoned in order to facilitate this. Uh, with regard to uh, changes that could be made for en uh, with respect to the road through projects, um, there will be a capital project put forward here in the next year or two at uh, 96th Street and 100th Avenue. So that's where you come out uh, beside the apartments. Um, in there, there would likely be some widening of the intersection to uh, put in dedicated turning lanes uh, that could help alleviate some of the peak traffic that's uh, are currently being experienced in those areas. Uh, with regard to the amount of traffic that would be generated by this facility, they would need to do a little bit of work on what that would look like. I imagine a lot of it would flow off peak uh, on the weekends when there were larger areas. So I'm not sure that that would necessarily mean uh, would trigger upgrades, but that would be something they'd need to look at. I could have a follow-up question. Um, you can also um, access 92nd Street uh, coming in from whatever road that is on the south boundary of Smith. Um, is there any um, opportunity to um, change traffic flow so we are basically skirting the neighborhood rather than uh, going through it, through the middle of it off of 100th Avenue? Thank you, Chair Bressy. 
I think with the upgrades that were made uh, over the last couple of years on that road paving it, um, we'll, I think you'll see some of that traffic naturally flow over to uh, 92nd Street uh, and 92nd Avenue where the signalized intersection is over towards the Tim Hortons. Uh, and use utilize that road, but if it's out of town uh, teams that are coming in, I think you'll you will see most of them flow towards 96th Street and 100th Avenue, just on their way back to hotels and amenities. Okay. Councillor Thiessen, then O'Connor, then Berg. Oh, sorry, sorry Councillor Thiessen, I'm going. I'm going to. I promised Councillor Bosch she was next, so Councillor Bosch then Thiessen. Thank you, Councillor Bressy. Uh, I guess my question is, and I can't vote on, on this committee, but I think we need to like think about, for instance, the public school board correspondence and the Grand Spirit correspondence that is attached to this information in regards to uh, the Smith property and the Avondale property, where um, the school board wants it in potentially in Avondale. I, I think we need to talk about it and not just blow that off and uh, Grand Spirit would like the Smithland for some potential projects for them. So I don't think it's as easy as a one and done. Additionally, uh, the site plan that I had seen in the past, and I'd like to see something like that up front um, at a council meeting, uh, the parking was a concern in the Smith um, subdivision, uh, or the Smithland. So I'd like to see the comparison again. Um, because that, that parking piece in the Smith was, was definitely something that, uh, that struck me um, in comparison to Avondale, for instance, or even Cobblestone, but uh, Avondale in particular. Councillor Thiessen. I also just would remind, I just also would remind committee that this is a motion to recommend to council and all of council will be able to debate this when it goes forward. So I would encourage us to Make sure we're, sh we're using this time to ask questions we might need to ask to inform that debate and use this time to shape a motion that will set council up well for debate, but we'll have ample time to debate this at council too. But Councillor Thiessen. Yeah, thanks uh, Chair Bruce. I do have a question, uh, but I will make comments because uh, I very much agree with uh, Councillor Bosch and uh, Councillor Blackmore in regards to the use of this land. I live in this area. It's largely residential uh, and when you travel up uh, the residential roads whenever they're having soccer days on the weekend, it's very hard to find parking. And most people that are using the outdoor fields there literally don't use the parking lot. They park along adjacent to the field and all that stuff. Now inside this plan, we're talking about potentially 3,000 people in bleachers, whether or not we take that out or not. So my concern all of a sudden becomes, how do we get 3,000 people in and out of this place that's sort of hen-pegged in with res one residential road on one side and a single lane on the other. And then I start thinking about 94th Street and people potentially getting in accidents trying to rush a left-hand turn on that road because they don't know any other way out because they're from out of town. So I think there are definitely a lot of considerations we need to make when we're talking about these Smithlands, not to mention the promises we've already made in the community. Um, my question is uh, for you, Director Glavin, uh, on the work that was done adjacent on Park Road. Uh, currently, it's only a single lane um, and uh, pretty much a rural, rural standard crossing. Is there any opportunities to expand that road, to double lane it, or to even add turning lanes into, into a big soccer uh, recreation center area that you know, we're going to have increased traffic flow if we decide to build here? Thank you, Chair Bressy. Um, it obviously wasn't built into the design here. I, I think, you know, we'd have to have engineering look at it, see how much right of way is there for expansion. Uh, if you eliminated parking lanes, that is one way, theoretically, you could uh, increase um, traveling lanes. Uh, but we'd have to take a look and see what the capacity was there uh, or that is there to use. Uh, Councillor O'Connor, Berg, then Mayor Clayton. Yes. Sir, I'm ready to close. Uh, if, if Mr. Chairman, if other committee members don't have comments, I'm ready to close. Oh, sure. We do have a few more, but I'll make sure you get to close before we vote. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair Bratsy. Uh My concern is, um, and I'd like to have administration bring back to council a little bit more 
information on the impacts on parking for both the Smith and the Avondale. And if I were to make a preference because of the support from the school board, I'd like to see uh, the dome go on that area because of the uh, availability of lots of parking. Uh, access will not be a problem. And I know that they want to punch through across 100 and I think the bypass at some point in time in the development of that area. So I think it makes more sense for me that we need the information to come back from administration. And uh, I believe the restrictions in the Smith subdivision is residential. We've got another ask there for another society to build a uh, high residential there. So uh, I'm not sure if I can make a decision on this today and I'd like to have information come back uh, to, to council for more debate on accessibility. So, and again, I just would highlight that this, the motion that we're debating today is do we send this to council for debate, not making a decision today? Councillor Berg. Yeah, thank you, Chair Bressy, and, I, and I'm all for sending it to Council for debate, uh, but I do have a lot of questions around the Smith area. Uh, we haven't seen a footprint yet to see if there's adequate room to put this dome. Looking at the one in Edmonton, it had a massive footprint, and so I struggle to visualize it here. Uh, there are houses just to the north, so uh, depending on placement, it would block their sun to the south. Um, and then again, all of the parking as well. So. I love it from the standpoint that yes, it's next to Rotary Fields and love it that it's next to the activity reception center, but I do question the footprint. So um, I may make a subsequent motion that uh, we actually see a footprint or design as to how it would actually fit and work here. Uh, that's outside of the transportation issues that have been brought up. Thank you. Yeah, just to share my thoughts on it. Very happy to send this to council for debates. I'll be voting yes to this right now. And I'm also very happy to do additional work in Smith um, to figure out what are the transportation impacts. I also think that in the Avondale site, we've done very comprehensive community consultation through the area redevelopment plan. So if something ends up in Avondale, I'm very comfortable just putting it there without further public consultation of the neighborhood because they've had that opportunity. The folks in Smith haven't been able to have that opportunity of what would be a regional facility. And so in my opinion is if it ends up in Smith, we should be giving Smith an opportunity to weigh in on this prior to that as well. Uh, my other concern is that we've been talking with the county about maybe partnering on their facility for a while, but we've had no committed money to it. And maybe now that we've said in principle, we're okay spending some money on a facility, we can move that conversation forward. So I think we should be having that conversation as well. So. Happy to support this today. Probably will submit it, support it at council so that we can just do more work and so we can advance these conversations. But I don't think today yet, I'm not at the place yet of convinced, hey, it should go in Smith, but certainly think we should continue exploring the site. I see Councillor Pilot. Uh, thanks, Chair Bresci. Um, I guess for me, if we're going to, I mean, I'm happy to support this when it comes to, to council because I do think that's the right location. I'm hearing concerns from colleagues about access and parking and so it if administration if it's not too much work i think you're going to have the same concerns on all three locations we are you're driving a lot of vehicles through an area the riverstone area is single lane traffic each side of the road coming in and out the comm site's already very congested with single lane traffic coming in and out so i don't see them being any different challenges in any of the three areas but i am wondering if that's a, a, a concern around some council colleagues if we should look at all three areas for traffic impact i'm hearing only the concern about what it could do in rotary I guess my gut is the concern would be even bigger and, and potentially Riverstone and could be really bad in the comp if there was an event at the same time as school coming in or going out. So if we're going to have that conversation when it gets to council about access, I just want to be very careful and cautious that we're having it about all three locations, not taking this location and making it sound like it could be potentially worse. Because really, in my opinion, I see a road that drives right by there in Park Lane that's not very high traffic, that's got accesses out to 100th and 92nd. I see a lot more congestion potential at those other locations, but that's my opinion. So I'm just hoping that when this comes back to council for a decision, maybe we can look at all three of those areas because I think we'll see that that's going to be a problem in all three, and that's that's what happens when you put a major facility anywhere. It's going to create congestion. So just my thoughts on that. Okay, thank you, and definitely agree with you on Riverstone. Just would point out we did do a lot of that work through the Avondale ARP process, but certainly have it for Riverstone. Uh, Mayor Clayton. I think that a question, <clears throat> excuse me, before I close for administration, based on the motion as worded um, and that uh, once the land was identified, the 
preparation and detailed of uh, preparation of detailed budgeting design and project planning commencement commencement. Can you let um, committee know how many times this discussion and at what point we would come back to council for additional input? Scheduling. There seems to be comments in regards to you know footprint, parking, etc. And so um, project planning, in my opinion, includes those things. But I'm just wondering, uh, once this goes to council, it's approved, when it would come back to council for further input. Scheduling. Thank you through the chair. Um, administration would certainly endeavor to bring that back. Um, the relevant information as uh, quickly as possible um, without consulting with internal stakeholders. Um, today, I'm not really comfortable giving you a time frame, but could certainly do that um, and perhaps have a, a better idea uh, for Monday's council meeting. Sure, I guess a better question is to confirm that it will come back to council for further discussion and input, correct? Through the chair, uh, thank you, yes. So just following, up, following up that, I'd, uh, the two mandatory times I could think council would have to touch this would be uh, we'd have to pass a bylaw to rezone land and we need to pass a borrowing bylaw. So I know that even just under the Municipal Government Act, we'd be required to touch this at least two more times. Yeah, I mean, my question was a bit facetious with intent, but I mean, the point being that this wouldn't be a go to council, approve it, and all of a sudden council has no opportunity for additional input. Uh, there, in projects like this, there is opportunity for continued conversation. Um, and I do remind um, Council Bradley, there was some initial engagement in the Smith area when we put the activity reception center. So although it wasn't on the uh, structure we're talking today, we have have had some input from that, that area um, in uh, previous facilities. Um, I just wanted to close on this motion. Um, uh, council, or committee rather, the intent today is to get this to council for further discussion. Uh, yes, we've had discussions with the school board in regards to the Avondale um, redevelopment plan, which indicates long-term recreation facilities. Um, speaking with the chair of the board, as indicated through her letter, I did a follow-up. She's happy to have discussions on the long-term facilities. Um, Domes are short-term in nature, they're not permanent, um, and so um, there needs to be an understanding there. I do like and appreciate the comments and happy to take it away. We did at the Intermunicipal uh, Collaboration Committee have discussions about the fact that we were talking um, with Swan City about whether where the best place for a dome was, which is not, hadn't to date been part of the discussion with the uh, with our regional partners in regards to an expansion of other facilities. So there has been discussions. Um, those discussions could be formalized. I think it's fair to say that this should go to an ICC, an intermunicipal collaboration committee um, committee meeting in the near future for further discussion. Happy to have conversations uh, with the school board about the long-term recreational assets that are could be potentially implemented into the Avondale plan and as well um, correspondence and communication with Grand Spirit Foundation as council is aware one of our stakeholder uh, one of our initiatives is regular stakeholder meetings we did have a stakeholder meeting with Grand Spirit Foundation yesterday happy to have further discussions with them um, and council um, once this gets to council we can talk about where other opportunities are for um, housing projects in our city that um, and, and there have a full discussion on what the possibilities are for the future. So today, uh, this is to get this to council for uh, um, committee to approve this to get to council for discussion and debate um, and, and just a reassurance that this will still have continued conversation. So it's not a, um, it, it, although it may seem that this is going to council and we're going to approve it, there's still lots of work and discussion to be had ahead. So I encourage committee to support this. Thank you. Great. Um, Councillor O'Connor, I did see your hand up, but that was to close. I, although I did do the best job at uh, last call. So I wanted again, reminding you that this is just- to Yeah, I understand that. Okay I, I just believe the way the motion is written isn't what council and what the debate has been around the table. Uh, I, I don't know if I can support this in this way. So I'm, I'm sorry. I just think it says approve the lands to go forward. So how does that leave room for us to debate it later on? So I have a problem with it. Because it says committee recommend council. So therefore this means this goes to council. Yeah. Okay, fine. And uh, there'll definitely be opportunities when this motion gets made to council, if it goes to council to make movement, to make a motion to amend it as well. Uh, 
All right, I think I, I, think I heard a close. Uh, Councilor Clayton, I did give Councilor O'Connor another chance in, so are you okay with me calling the question? Sure, call the question, thanks, Chairman. Okay, awesome, thank you. Then I will call the question. Great. And that motion carries and will be discussed at our upcoming council meeting. Uh, is there any additional business we need to do on this? Again, reminding everybody that it will come to council. Councillor Berg. Yeah, so I would mentioned uh, that I might request something from, uh, from our administration, but uh, Mayor Clayton satisfied uh, my question, so um, I'll, I'll just pass on it. Yeah. I also know our very fine administrative team has been listening to the conversation here, and I'm, I'm personally confident we'll come armed with questions they might get when we come to council. Mayor Clayton, is your head just still up, or are you hope to do additional business? No, I did have a, a, just a question, a follow-up question. Thanks, Chairman. Um, Ms. Casualty, in, in, in preparation for discussion and debate, um, could we just ensure that uh, uh, Swan City FC um, attends the next council meeting so that they're made aware of this? And I'm, I'm sure they are, or they're probably already watching, but we can, can we just make a formal request for them to attend the next council meeting, please? As well as not to limit to soccer, as well as um, let's give a fair um, information or and or warning per se to other user groups of this potential facility so that they have an opportunity to um, address it as well. Thanks. And I see Ms. Gagelay writing that down, so I'm confident that will be actioned on. Uh, Councillor Thiessen? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chair Bressy. I think it would be appropriate, too, considering just two two portions down, we have a letter from Grand Spirit in regards to the Smithlands. Uh, as there was a council motion uh, to dedicate a portion of the Smithlands to a residential build, and it is currently zoned for multifamily residential, I think it would be only fair that they are also asked to be at this meeting. So if they want to appeal uh, what we may be debating or discussing, that they can at least come and be a delegation as well. And I'm uh, just, anybody's welcome to come to any of our meetings. They certainly would be welcome. Uh, Councillor Pilott. Uh Thanks, Chair Bressy. I guess I just have um, a question for administration. Um, and I'm wondering at the Invest GP if it's the right opportunity. But if we were as a council looking to acquire more lands, as we discussed yesterday with Grand Spirit, for potential seniors and family housing, would the Invest GP be the right uh, committee to bring that up at, or is it financial services, or where would we ask administration to start identifying other potential land sources for seniors and family-assisted living? So, so I see Ms. Pinnock. I think, I think that's a question for Deputy CAO, Mr. Chairman, in regards to Councillor Councilor, um, Palat's question is really, where should he ask that question? Sure, I'll yeah. boot it to Mr. Yeah, Miller and then feel free to pass that on if you wish, Mr. Miller. All right, uh, thanks, Chair Bressy. Uh, yeah, I think the most appropriate place would be through the Invest GP uh, committee. Okay, awesome. Okay, thanks for that. So, uh, for council members, I'll be happy to make a motion when it comes to Invest GP portion of our committee for us to start looking at lands, regardless of whether Smith is, is taken for Grantsburg or not. We know we're short housing doors in our community. So, I think it's incumbent on us to start asking the administration to look for further lands, anyways, besides Smith. Um, so I appreciate that's a concern. I also want to remind we don't have a project that's come to our table yet from Grand Spirit where there was lots of conversation, but nothing pending that we're, we're just jumping up and down that there's a project. So I'm not sure we're hurting Grand Spirit as long as we can find other land for them. So thanks for that. Great. Thank you. Mayor Clayton. Thanks, Chairman Bressy. Uh, just to Councillor Teeson's comments, uh, when we get to that item on the agenda, I intended to um, make a motion to address that. So just a comment rather than a question. Thanks. Great. And can I move on to the correspondence? Excellent. We do have a letter from the Public School Division. Is anybody willing to do some business with us, even if it's just to receive? Mayor Clayton, I don't know if your hand's up again or if it's new up, but I'm going to you anyways. Yeah, that's what I was I was trying to get between Mitch Greens. I apologize. Uh, yeah, happy to receive this letter, make a motion to receive this letter for information. Uh, just for uh, context, uh, um, myself, 
as well as uh, Chief Glavin, and I apologize, I don't recall who else was in the room, met with the superintendent as well as the chair of the board and one of her school board trustees to talk about the future of the Avondale Re Redevelopment Plan, whether or not anything had changed, as I indicated, Nothing changes on an area redevelopment plan without public discussion and debate. So nothing had changed. They're very um, interested in the long, in the plan as laid out and in that plan it identifies long-term uh, development as um, recreation being a priority. They also indicated to me that north of, after the demolition, which starts in 2023, demolition of the Composite High School and Leisure Centre, they will look to implement uh, an outdoor soccer field as well as potentially a ball diamond. So they will have um, they will have surface recreation based on the short term recreation plan, and then they still want to work with us going forward on the long term recreation, which could include things such as a, a court sport facility. So just happy to make a motion to receive this letter for correspondence. Excellent, definitely in order. Any conversation or debate? And I'll call this to question. Motion carries. And if sorry, with you, Mayor Clayton, I'll turn to you again for the Grand Spirit letter too. Sure, not a problem. Just let me move to it. Uh, this letter, as you see in your package, was received um, recently from the Grand Spirit Foundation, identifying um, the projects that they um, are working on, such as you know the increase in affordable housing and developing uh, housing opportunities. It identifies uh, various needs that they have and, and talks about um, their needs assessment, which identifies that up to uh, in the Grand Spirit regional area that over 3,000 households are required currently. It uh, identifies um, the transfer of land uh, in regards to the Smith subdivision. And uh, really, they talk about other partnerships they're working on uh, with the Northwest Polytech and a continuing cared um, operator partnership um, talking about the Park Avenue project. So it was really a great letter of information. Happy to make a motion to receive it for information um, and I have a subsequent motion following that. Thank you. So we'll vote on receive for information first and uh, Councillor Thiessen. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Council Chair Bressy. Uh, just a question. Uh, inside the letter, it states that there were two attachments uh, that were there for our convenience for Council. One is in regards to the needs assessment report, as the Mayor alluded to. The other is in regards to uh, previous Council motions that uh, were sent, uh, uh, well, that, decisions that were made at this table. So I guess my question is, how come these attachments that were here to sort of inform Council a little bit more weren't included with this letter? Sure, if that's Mr. Miller or Chief Lemieux. Okay, Chief Lemieux. Uh, thank you through the chair. So uh, that's our omission. So those should have been included and uh, I believe they've been circulated to council, but they should have been included so we can make sure we, uh, I'm not sure what the process is, if you want us to include them with the next meeting agenda so that, or bring them to the council uh, meeting. But uh, those documents are available and have been circulated to council. They just haven't made it on this agenda. What I'd suggest, if it's all right with you, Councillor Thiessen, is if they just, if administration just added them to this agenda packet so the public can go after this meeting to find them on this agenda. Would that be possible from administration? I'm seeing head shakes. Would that be acceptable to you, Mr. Thiessen? Uh, I'm fine. I've already okay. seen the letter and all the attachments as it was included in our Grand Spirit board agenda packet. So uh, every member of Grand Spirit got to read that. I just thought that it would be appropriate that all members of council and committee got to read that too at this meeting. No, and all members of council did have an opportunity to see that. That did get circulated to us, but I think it's a good catch. It would be great to get that up so members of the public can see that as well. All right, we do have a motion to receive for information on the table, so I'll call that to question. That motion carries. And Mayor Clayton, you had another motion? Yeah, I think, I think I'm um, happy if somebody from committee would like to make the motion. However, I really just want to, um, I think that Councillor Plot's motion that he'll tend to bring forward to in the best, in best GP committee will handle it. Um, I just I really just want to talk about the future communication with Grand Spirit Foundation and opportunities in growth um, and, and prioritizing those projects. Uh, um, they've identified um, projects that are priority that have been initiated. Um, then um, they've 
identified the Smith subdivision as priority number three after the other projects that sort of are in a different level of execution. Uh, but I think that uh, following a motion at uh, InvestGP, uh, the assumption, but it could be formalized, would be that the mayor and CAO um, or appropriate um, administration meet with Grand Spirit to talk about uh, land opportunities for the city to truly identify specific areas. Even if the city of Grand Prairie doesn't currently own certain land, there's definitely opportunities for housing in our city. And I think those questions expanding on the conversation we had yesterday are valuable. So I'm happy um, if committee wants to formalize that, uh, direct the mayor to have future conversations on housing opportunities in the city of Grand Prairie, great. However, um, just knowing that following the motion of acquisitions of land and our great relationship that we have with Grand Spirit, these conversations will continue. I just wanted to put it out there if the committee wanted to formalize that. Thanks. I think for me personally, committee is definitely welcome to do what it wants, but for me personally, I'd I'd suggest leaving that to invest GP. It seems like it's more in that wheelhouse. And also it's time these other committees started getting a longer oil list. I'm not seeing anybody raising their hands asking to make a motion. Um, but definitely, I'm seeing a lot of interest in that conversation just by faces for when we get to invest GP, Mayor Clayton. So I definitely think there's appetite for that discussion later in the morning. Uh, I'll turn it to Chief Lemieux then to give us uh, an update on the outstanding items list. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'd propose a couple changes to the uh, outstanding items list. Uh, item 1255 was dealt with today. So I'd like to propose we remove that from the list and uh, we have other a number of other uh, items that we're due on Q1 this is the end of Q1 so obviously we're not going to meet that deadline and one of the reasons for that is we've been busy working on the uh, proposed recreational facility report so I would uh, recommend that uh, the items that are listed for Q1 be amended to Q2. Just a question about that Q1 to Q2 amendments uh, looking at workflow is there any concerns about putting more reports to Q2, is there any um, concerns about the ones that are currently in Q2 will have to be bumped to Q3? So thank you for that question. We do, uh, with my team, review those on a monthly basis. So I may uh, propose some more changes later, but at this time, I'd just uh, recommend we switch them to Q Q2. Okay, excellent, thank you. Business? Sure, Councillor O'Connor. Yes, I'd like to move that council receive the March 28th, 2023 outstanding out can't even speak English. Outstanding items list as amended for information. Excellent. Definitely in order. I'll call that question. Thank you. And I was going to ask Councillor Blackmore how long she a break she'd like for her committee, but she had to step out for a minute. So maybe I'd suggest we come back at 11 for the next meeting. Would that be acceptable to everyone? Okay, well then I will call this meeting adjourned.